It was a big deal when a bit first became a pixel, when a series of bytes became a vector, a quadratic equation became a curve. But did anyone know just how big a deal it was going to be? When computers first appeared on the scene, graphics pioneers pounced, eager to learn what this technology could do for them. The first use of computer graphics was to help engineers represent the machine's memory operations. But soon, they were being used for many other functions. From the serious business of tracking missile trajectories to more lighthearted graphical experiments. The Cold War brought urgency and government funding. DARPA was formed in response to Sputnik with a charter to do things quickly. It was kind of Wild West sort of stuff. By 1963, computers tracked airplanes, spurring innovations in both graphics and computer interfaces, precursors of the light pen and mouse. Ivan Sutherland demonstrated his Sketchpad computer program that same year. Its graphical user interface and light pen made it more accessible, a tool for engineering drawing and more. I had loved engineering drawing ever since I was in grade school and had engineering drawings on my, on my book covers. And so doing something with drawings was something that would naturally attract me. Another advance in computer-aided design was on the hardware side. The General Motors program DAC-1, which used custom hardware, created three-dimensional models for manufacturing. Students saw potential for their own amusement and a little interplanetary warfare. Spaceships were very much in the news. It was abundantly clear that people didn't know how to fly spaceships very well. And in the fall of 1961, I had a demonstration program that had two spaceships which could maneuver around the screen and could fire torpedoes at each other. And the name of that game was Space War. These primitive ships and torpedoes helped ignite a passion for computers on college campuses. In 1965, the University of Utah started its computer science department under the direction of Dave Evans. This legendary program attracted phenomenal talent. In the early days at the university, the computer graphics department was extraordinary. Of course, I didn't have anything to compare it to, so I didn't understand that there was, this sort of thing wasn't going on in other places. For me, coming out of high school, the question is, how do I get to the frontier? How do I get to the new stuff? I don't even know what it meant to be in the frontier. It's just like, wherever that frontier is, that's where I want to be. It was the only place I applied, and I was completely pulled into it. One of the things I did there was I made a model of my left hand and then went through this laborious process of digitizing and then I wrote a program to animate it and then that led to getting my first paper published. Students and faculty at Utah pioneered techniques and technology that became the foundation of a new industry. For graphics experiments, graduate student Martin Newell discovered the perfect object, his wife Sandra's teapot. The teapot was complex enough to be a challenge to model and render, but not too complex for available tools. The humble teapot became a standard mathematical model for 3D computer graphics. In the 1970s, one breakthrough followed another at Utah. Advances in 3D modeling, textures, anti-aliasing, rendering, and shading, all of which increased realism. The whole field after a while began to use realism as a guiding principle. I would say to people, they're like, look at the table in front of you. Nobody has ever been able to make a picture that gets anywhere close to capturing the image that's right in front of you. And I can't say that anymore. Artists were also experimenting with this new medium. I think for art to really flourish, you need tools that will grow along with it. Leon Harmon said, this code exists, we're not going to do anything with it. Would you like to come to Bell Labs and try it? This was something very exciting to me. 
Some of the earliest computer art and films were produced by Lillian Schwartz, artist in residence at Bell Labs. I was complaining and saying, I wish I had more software here. And then I heard this voice behind me saying, well, what would you want? I soon had a very simple software, but I could do animation. I never said, thank God it's Friday. In 1974, entrepreneur Alex Schur financed a computer graphics lab at the New York Institute of Technology to make films. With state-of-the-art computers, he lured talent from the University of Utah. Alex wanted to be the new Walt Disney. And the reason we knew this was every day he said he didn't want to be the new Walt Disney. He put us on a screaming edge because nobody in the world had full-color graphics. Nobody. We did. And we just went hog wild. He viewed us as the artists of the future, as the new animators. We were up around the clock, just don't go to sleep unless you had to, because everything was new and exciting. Around this time, innovators saw potential in consumer markets. In the late 70s and early 80s, two new home computers, both with color displays, hit the market. The Apple II personal computer, and the Commodore 64 personal computer. Both gave users easy ways to explore this new field on their own. Players were captivated, jumping into fantasy worlds as explorers, intrepid plumbers, or as spacemen, light years beyond the needle and wedge graphics of the space war era. The 1984 release of Apple's graphically powerful Macintosh computer led to an explosion of consumer-focused graphics and art creation tools, products that yielded sophisticated results. At least they were capable of sophisticated results. If we have a tool that allows us to take a film image and turn that into numbers, into a digital image, and then you have a tool for manipulating those numbers in a way to put that back out onto film, the possibilities were completely unlimited. This is a tool for kind of making images obey your commands. Greater complexity required faster machines. University of Utah graduate Jim Clark founded Silicon Graphics, whose high-performance workstations dominated graphical computing for two decades. The work at the New York Institute attracted the attention of Hollywood film director George Lucas. George Lucas had decided to bring movie making into, for out of the 1940s level of technology into the 1970s. George had made Star Wars, the first one, and it was so significant that he wanted to bring more technology in. We thought we were being hired to uh, make scenes in George's movies. No, turned out that wasn't what George hired us to do. He hired us to build these machines. A digital video editor, a digital audio editor, and a digital film printer. Paramount hired Industrial Light and Magic to do the special effects on Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And they wanted to put some of this newfangled computer graphics stuff in their movie. And the guys at ILM said, we don't do that, but I think the guys next door, that'd be, being us, I think that's what they do. I said, we're going to design a camera shot that'll blow his socks off. And that's what we did. That's what the Genesis demo shot is. It was the big breakthrough. He told his buddy Steven Spielberg about us. And Steven had us in his next movie, which was Young Sherlock Holmes. Beauty and the Beast came out in 1991. So the whole world noticed that, wow, this is a huge success, and they use this computer technology. 91 was also the year that Terminator 2 came out. Two years later, in 93, Jurassic Park came out. And that was the last domino, and then that was the headlong rush to switch everything over to, to, to digital. In 1995, Pixar produced the first full-length animated film, Toy Story. It was a smash, winning an Academy Award for computer graphics animator John Lasseter. Born in an era of Cold War threats, nurtured in environments of unfettered creativity, the art and technology of computer graphics are thriving. They help us explore things previously unseen because they're too far, too fast, 
too large, or too slow to be observed with a human eye. Computer graphics have changed how we create art, entertainment, and design. They've affected the creation of life-saving medical technologies, and they've transformed the tools of our daily lives. Reality, augmented reality, virtual reality. It was a big deal when a bit became a pixel, when a series of bytes became a vector, a quadratic equation became a curve. In the rapidly expanding field of computer graphics, there's no limit to what those pixels become tomorrow.